kind of I kind of break it down into four roles. You have a bookkeeper, okay, and it's a, a clerical position. It's a person that's basically um, just pushing the transactions through. You know, you give them a bill, they put the bill in. Um, the the accounting system. Mm-hmm. Um, some know how to do it right. Some some just don't know what they're doing. They're just pulling the put, put, putting a piece of paper in the system. You know right. the numbers in the system. I'm your host, Great Moore. The best companies hire the best people, and these organizations have the influence to make the world a better place. Our goal is to serve our listeners through stellar and knowledgeable guests and the topics we cover, such as mental health, employee engagement, leadership, and more in order to enrich the communities we serve. Awesome. This morning, I have the pleasure to have Melanie Zeman on the podcast. Very excited to share her story with you all. Um, Melanie is a fractional CFO, so... um, before I read her bio, uh, give me a quick, what is a fractional CFO? Fractional CFO is a person that can come in. So a small business, um, and when I think small business, I say $50 million or less, okay. that can't afford a uh, full-time CFO. Okay. Okay. And so we can come in as a fractional CFO or an interim CFO. So a fractional person would come in just, you know, for hours uh, for a day, or they may come in once a month, once a quarter, what have you, depending on the client's needs. Okay, And Perfect. then an interim, of course, would then be taking the place to say somebody went out on maternity leave or something, then yeah, an interim CFO. Okay, perfect. Well, let me give you a quick bio of Melanie. She's got over 25 years of successful leadership guidance and knowledge as a financial executive. She's energetic, forward-thinking, and creative individual with high ethical standards. Her experience as a high-level controller and CFO has made her a strategic visionary with sound technical skills and analytical ability, good judgment, and strong operational focus. Melanie has a diverse background in industries such as service, manufacturing, distribution, and construction. She's been active in the development of the corporation's plans and programs as a strategic leader. She is well-organized and self-directed team player. Melanie evaluated all processes and made recommendations of new systems and then organizing the implementation of these systems. Melanie can relate to people at all levels of an organization and possesses excellent communication skills, a good educator who is trustworthy, willing to share information and serve as a mentor, a decisive individual who possesses a big-picture perspective. So... um, Definitely want to get into your experiences, and again, thanks so much for joining me. So how did you get started in the wonderful world of accounting? Oh, gosh. So many, many moons ago, um, I I went to work for this guy, and I told him, I said, my number one priority when he hired me was to keep me busy because the company I had worked for prior to that couldn't keep me busy. So I come in, and he goes, oh, this is going to be no problem. I got this. You know, you're going to be so busy, you're not going to know what to do with yourself. So great. So we go in there, and two weeks later, I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, you know, going, hmm, okay. So I go and sit at his office, sit down at his desk, and he goes, What's up? I said, remember that conversation we had when, um, uh, you know, when you hired me that you were going to keep me busy for, you know, for weeks and months? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And I said, well, we're done with all those projects. And he just, he got that deer in the headlights kind of look in his face. And I said, so what's plan B? <laughs> <laughs> so he started um, uh, instructing me in accounting. And I was going to school at the time part time. And So I was like, uh, so he started teaching me, and so I ended up getting an accounting degree. Okay. So that started my my journey. So um, did you just love the numbers, or what was the... You know, originally, when I uh, left California, uh, I finished high school out there, so when I left... When I got out of high school, I took a law class. I was going to be an attorney. I'm, okay. I'm going to age myself. I wanted to be the Perry Mason woman. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, so that didn't work out. So I was like, yeah, that's going to be way too much school. So I decided that um, everybody, no matter what the economy is doing, needs somebody to count their money, right? right? So why not be an accountant? 
Oh, that's excellent. So how did you get to Georgia from California? Well, I was originally from here. So hmm. uh, I was originally from here, but growing up, we lived all over the United States and abroad. And so I ended up being in 12 schools in, wow. from first or kindergarten through 12th. So, yeah. Wow, so I came uh, home. I came home. I was, I was, I'm a true Georgia peach. Okay. So I was born right there on Peachtree Street. Really? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so how, so, so you have this first job as, as <clears throat> learning the accounting. Right. How did you, um, how was the schooling? I mean, how did so I, w- I did the non-traditional route. Okay. okay, so I didn't go straight from high school. I did take a class in the evenings in law, um, but as I said, you know, I decided that wasn't for you know that whole that was going to be years. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I moved here, I started just taking some classes, and when I when he started teaching me accounting, I was like, well, I'm just going to take the accounting classes. I'm not going to mm-hmm. fool with the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Melanie has her own way of doing things. Remember that creative thing that yes, you said? Yes, yeah, I saw yeah, that. yeah. Melanie's creative. So, um, so yeah. So we did. Uh, so I took all the accounting classes, <laughs> took all the business. So, and then I was like, oh crap, I might as well go back and do it all. So I ended up doing all the major stuff first, and then had to go back and do all my core. Okay. So yeah, yeah. A little backwards. <laughs> so, so after, <laughs> so you're taking accounting, and then after a year or so, you got to go back and do like. English 101. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I did some of that okay. prior. So <clears throat> this is a, you know, this took quite a few years, you know, because I was working a uh, full-time job, went to school part-time, had okay. a couple other part-time jobs. So, wow. uh, you know, I did that. Then I um, met my husband, my um, Peter, okay. and um, during my bar years, uh, <laughs> uh, that was part of my part-time job bartending okay. and waiting tables. And then we went on to, um, so met Peter been happily married. He's put up with me for these last 33, 34 years, whatever it's been. And um, we had a couple kids, Cameron and Victoria. And so, yeah. Um, so by the time Cameron was, our uh, son, oldest son was six, five. When he was five, I f- finally finished my degree in accounting. Okay. From Kennesaw State. Okay. So. Excellent. Now, what was, so what was your first job uh, outside of college once you had your degree? Oh, at the time when I got my degree, I was actually working for um, Hans Grohe um, at the time, otherwise known as Hans Grohe. They're a plumbing manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's amazing what a piece of paper will do for you. They immediately promoted me. And so that's, you know, I was already in accounting and had switched okay. jobs from the guy that was training me. So okay. um, so that's kind of where um, it kind of all started, though. So how was accounting... Um what was kind of the makeup of accounting back then? Was it mostly males? Yes, but I actually, I was very fortunate. I had a lady that was the controller at the time, and she was a great mentor. She mm-hmm. was awesome. Um, and so I learned a lot from her okay. um, uh, during that time. Um, but I'm not your typical accountant, okay? okay? So, you know, like, you know, the whole stereotype bean counter, you know, mm-hmm. the person on the computer and their head in the numbers and computer, you know, um, I'm a little bit more outgoing than, okay. than, than your right. standard, right. okay? So if you're looking at the stereotype, um, and I think that really served me well because I can really, I, I really flourished in, because I was a great communicator, mm. Um, so, and part, I think, of a controller's job is being able to uh, communicate with the other p- people within the organization, right. you know, top management, you know, the executive team. You, if you want to be in that role, you've got to, uh, to be able to communicate with people at all levels, different personalities. So was that just natural for you? Because that's something that, that we've talked about before is, you know, once you get outside of your sphere of technicality right you then have to go and, and talk with the c-suite right? right you have to go talk with the executives yeah um how was how was that the first couple meetings where cash flow maybe might not been there i mean you, were you just comfortable at I'm the just, beginning you know i'm just comfortable you know just i think because of the way i was raised you know everybody puts their pants on the same way That's was right. the old saying you know yeah. um and so just i didn't wasn't intimidated by that yeah so you know if something needed to be said melanie's not afraid to speak up yeah. <laughs> well and i guess that i mean moving 12 times oh uh, yeah you you've either got to yeah you got to get learn. with it or or kind of just stay in the corner absolutely right? so absolutely. You, you took the other route of hey i'm just gonna 
Yeah, um, my family's pretty outspoken. Okay. Um, my parents were, um, so, you know, we were just, you know, my dad didn't have sons at the time. Um, and so, you know, he, he raised us to be strong, independent women. Right. And um, that's exactly what we ended up being. And so served us well. Well, I'm sure it did, especially back in, in those times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah, you're talking, you know. Uh, was raised in the 70s and, mm-hmm. you know, started my career in the 80s. And um, so, yeah, it was, you know, t- things were changing then. So, mm-hmm. for especially for women. Yes. No, I, and I could imagine those not being uh, convicted in what you were telling. Right. Uh, the executives could be, you know, if you were a little waffled, then they may, uh, might, push you around a little bit yeah exactly well i I always tell people is that uh, if you want to hire hire us you know you need to understand that we're going to tell you what you need to know not what you want to know that's right and uh, you know we we do that in the most respectful um, way that we possibly can but really you need to be able to do that and not all accountants can do that um you know they're you know just a little bit more reserved and um, and then don't like controversy, right. right? And I don't like controversy, but I think you need to be, especially with business owners, you have got to be as honest and forthwith with them mm-hmm. um, when you're having conversations with them. Because if that CEO has a vision, right, and they mm-hmm. want to be able to get wherever that vision is, well, they need somebody sitting next to them on the financial world that is able to talk to them and let them know, hey, you know what, you're going to need to take a left turn here, right? Um, whether you like to or not. <laughs> That's right. You know, so. so that brings up a good point. Uh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> before we kind of get into the to the meat of your experiences and in, in, in storytelling, what Kind of talk, walk me through, walk the audience through the roles of different folks in accounting, mm-hmm. right? And and how the different hats folks wear, and then how you come in as the CFO and kind of manage that that uh, environment. Gotcha. Um, so, kind of, I kind of break it down into four roles. You have a bookkeeper, okay, and it's a, a clerical position. It's a person that's basically um, just pushing the transactions through. You know, you give them a bill, they put the bill in um, the the accounting system. Mm-hmm. Um, some know how to do it right. Some some just don't know what they're doing. They're just pulling the put. Pu- putting a piece of paper in the system, you know, the numbers in the system. Um, And then you you have an accountant, somebody that the bookkeeper is reporting to. Um, They're a person that's a little bit higher level. They understand um, what that that transaction, what that document means, Mm -hmm. right? Um, At least they should. And then, um, and they'll do, you know, be in, in... over maybe the accounts payable and accounts receivable, you know, payroll, that type of thing. And then you'll have the controller. Now, the controller is the person that is putting all of these documents together that mm-hmm. the accountant and the bookkeeper are doing. Um, the controller is going to create the financial statements, going to okay. put all the numbers, get all those numbers from AP, accounts receivable, inventory, uh, construction, if it's that, you know, um, the project side. So they'll put all that information Mm -hmm. together and put it in a document so that the CFO can analyze the data that they're getting. Okay, so the CFO is really driving the vision of the um, uh, CEO, Mm -hmm. um, the owner of the business. And in order to do that, they analyze those financial statements. They're the ones that are going to help negotiate contracts. They're going to be the one that are going to be by the owner's side when they go to the bank and, or to a lender or an investor. Um, they'll be going to be at the board meetings, that type of thing. Okay. So what do you see? Um, do you see that as a gap in the smaller to medium-sized businesses that they just don't have? They, they may have the bookkeeper, the accountant, and controller, or maybe they just have somebody that is dual hatted right but maybe not that CFO yeah in the in our realm um, in our world if we kind of see you'll see like for a smaller business you'll you may see um, a bookkeeper mm-hmm. all right um, uh, you might have a, a controller um, involved but controllers are hard to come by these days so okay. it's a it's a really important role um, to be a controller but they are hard to find. Um, it is a, it's a, 
I think there they there was a time in there where accounting wasn't cool, right? Right. <laughs> well, when is accounting never cool? <laughs> 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 Let's think about that, right? Um, so um, so sometimes that that's a hard a hard position to fill. Um, I think you find you'll find a whole a lot more CFOs mm -hmm. because those are the ones that are going through the big the big firms the you know the big four firms going mm -hmm. through the audit and their CPAs that became CFOs. I see. All right, um, but controllers you don't have to see a whole lot of those. Um, it's a tough industry, but in our realm you'll see maybe a bookkeeper, maybe accountant, could be a, a family member that's handling the books, maybe the owner themselves is is trying to manage the books. Mm. Um, so that's kind of where we see. Okay. So as far as um, being the third-party advocate, uh, do you have any interesting stories where you were the third-party advocate, you weren't necessarily involved with the company day-to-day, -day, but you were, uh, you kind of, from a 30,000-foot view, help steer or maybe help protect a company where you then were able to come in and say hey we're kind of we're kind of going in the wrong direction yeah well um um i did have um with my pr uh, prior employer um <laughs> a um a, cons a gentleman that was in the construction industry okay um that was having a tough time um with his um accounting and trying to judge uh, juggle his um, financial world, if you will, mm -hmm. and it was pretty cool to see him, um, us being able, you know, to to come in there and really guide him um, uh, through the county minutia. Mm -hmm. And when you can have a client that uh, comes back to you and says, you know what, I just really appreciate everything you've done for me because I really didn't know what I was doing until you came on board and mm -hmm. helped mentor me through this. And now I I I think I get it. I think yeah. I understand. You know. Um, why I was losing money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and that's a that's pretty gratifying and gratifying when you get those kind of stories. No, I bet. Um, but sometimes you have some stories that aren't so uh, <laughs> um, gratifying. Uh, this um, there was an instance when I was a um, W two for a uh, for actually for a um, manufacturer. Okay. And they hired a new president. Um, of, for the company mm. to come in. And the gentleman that owned the business, the owner, was very a pretty conservative dude, okay? So this new president comes in, and he's a pretty hot <laughs> shot, you know? He's a suit kind of guy, you know? And um, he gets a credit card from the company, and he starts entertaining clients and stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I'm getting the American Express bill, and I'm, I'm looking at all these transactions on there, and I'm like, huh. And like we got a lot of hundred dollars just coming from this one <laughs> one place, and it's a strip joint okay. that's down the street from the office. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, this isn't gonna be good. No. So I was, and so I call the owner and I say, hey, you know, I just want you to let you know that our new president's got a lot of transactions at the <laughs> facility down the street. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, uh, okay. Um, I don't think he knew how to, ha you know, what to do at that right. point. You know, he's like he got this new guy, and he goes, "Well, I think he's just entertaining clients." And I said, "Yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> I guess he is, right?" <laughs> um, so then a few weeks, uh, I don't know how much time frame went by because this was a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, trying to make this short. So anyways, he um, came to me and asked me to write a check for um, a piece of machinery. It was a manufacturing firm. We had equipment. We were always getting new parts, and they're expensive. And so he asked me to write a check to this particular person for uh, like $6,500 mm -hmm. or something like that. And so I said, well, do you have an invoice? And he was like, nah, not right now. I don't, but I'll get you one. And I said, awesome. So he goes away. The end of the month comes. I'm reconciling the, the accounts. And I'm like, mm, hey, mm -hmm. dude, you know, where's where's my invoice? And he's like, oh, yeah, I got to get that for you. I'll, I'll get that for you. <laughs> so another couple weeks goes by. I'm like, uh, do I have an invoice? I said, well, how difficult is it to get this invoice? He goes, I'm trying. I promise you, I'm trying. So finally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go. This is back in the days where you actually got the actual check back in the envelope. Right. So <clears throat> I pull the check out, and I look at the signature on the back, and I'm like, hmm, okay. So there's a restaurant up the street from the, from the office, 
And so I go up to the street and I at lunchtime and I say, hey, do you have this person working here for you? And the manager at the restaurant says, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know who she is. And I said, great, is she here? Can I speak <laughs> with her? And he's like, um, well, she's not here today, but she'll be here tomorrow. And I said, okay, I'll come back. So I come back the next day and I said, is you know, this person here? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, she's here. Um, I said, I'm just going to sit at the bar then, and I'll wait for her. <laughs> and so I go to sit at the bar, and she comes up. She goes, oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm great. I need your, you, you to fill out this form. It's a W-9. I need your name, address, and Social Security number. She goes, excuse me? And I said, um, I have worked down the street for so-and-so, and this gentleman gave you a check for $6,500. <laughs> and she goes, oh, but that was for cleaning or something <laughs> like that. That was, the, I said, yeah, it was for services rendered. <laughs> Can fill out the form. <laughs> so, so what happened with the president? Uh, he never showed back up. Never he found out what I did. <laughs> I guess she must have called him. Surprise, surprise, yeah. right? Um, and yeah, he never showed up. So, uh, I but that's, a, I mean, you know, it, it's a humorous story. But at the same time, that's very. Oh, that's that's yeah. huge, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, because uh, you know, effectively, there's. Some pseudo embezzlement going on. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know the the company's funds are self gratification. Little self gratification, <laughs> but um, without having that uh, your conviction, right, right? To say, hey, this isn't right. Yeah. How long would how that have gone on? Exactly. How yeah. long? And and how many times do small companies? Um, put themselves in jeopardy. Oh, absolutely. So I had another company. I had a um, couple ladies working with me. I had an AR lady, and then I had another lady that was doing accounts payable. And um, so the accounts payable person is usually the person that's, you know, reconciling the credit cards, mm -hmm. right? And so um, she goes, away, she had to go away on vacation. She got married, and she was going on, on her honeymoon. And so I'm looking, um, and so she had gone on vacation, went on her honeymoon, and she came back, and then she was out or something, and I was, it was month in, and I was like, okay, I got to get this credit card reconciled so I can finish out the books. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'll just do it, you know, just easier than to wait, because I don't know when she was coming back. She probably was sick or something. So I'm going, <laughs> I'm going through the American Express, and I'm like, Oh, wow, there's a lot of new charges. So the owner at the time had a place down in Florida. And I was like, it's like, ah, there's a lot of things here. But I was, then I started thinking about where the president, you know, the owner was that month. And I'm like, but he wasn't down in Florida that, that m last month. And I keep on looking at things and I'm seeing flowers being delivered and all these other things and, and at the resort, a luxury resort down, in, down there in Florida. And I'm like, so I start looking at all these transactions. Then I start call, picking up the phone and, and calling people. Again, this was before you know we had all, all of the great technology we mm -hmm. have today. So I had to actually go and dig up some things. Come to find out, she comes back. And I said, oh, it sounds like you had a great honeymoon. She goes, oh, it was wonderful. We had such a great time. I said, I guess you did since you used the company credit card to have that honeymoon, oh, right? Wow. And she was like, what? And I said, yeah, I reconciled the credit card while you were gone. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> but, but without having, I mean, because I've had clients that they don't catch that that quick. No, they don't. There's people that, I've, that um, we've had backgrounds with that have gone years. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they, the owners are their own worst enemy, mm -hmm. okay? Because they, they're trusting that that person right mm -hmm. your your trust that you've hired this person you know maybe you didn't do a background check and maybe you should have done that right mm -hmm. um and you know you go years and then all of a sudden two million dollars later you're out and you know what happened well the owner needs to take responsibility right and you know sometimes it's good to, as what i call is have a checkup mm -hmm. you know you go to the doctor you know, to have your physical checkups, why not do a checkup of your of your business? Mm. Have a fractional CFO um, come in and take a look at your books and ask you questions. And it's not to spy on your controller or your CFO or your accountant, whatever the case may be, but maybe it's just to kind of get everybody back in focus on, you know, what's going on with your business. Mm -hmm. Have somebody, have a fractional CFO Come in and you know and review your balance sheet, your income statement, your cash flows, 
for the business mm. and see if there's any holes. It's not a forensic. I'm not talking about doing a forensic. I'm not a forensic accountant. I'm not even a CPA. Mm-hmm. I'm an accountant. I'm a controller. I've been in those roles. I, you know, I know the things to look at. You know, if you're looking at your balance sheet and you got a liability count and it has a negative balance in your liability count, there's an issue there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you look at your retained earnings and it's changing from one month to another, or if your retained earnings in the net income doesn't match to your P and L statement. You got an issue there. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things that owners, when they look at it, they get intimidated mm. by the balance sheet. And, and that's one thing that I think um, that we do really well is being able to um, talk on, at a level that's it's elementary. And that's what I always tell her. Elementary, my dear friend. Because <laughs> it, you don't need to talk big. You don't need to talk over your client's head. You know, it's important that you keep it simple, keep it matter of fact, and take the time to explain what the balance sheet is, what the P&L is. Everybody thinks that the P&L is the most important statement. It's mm. really not. It's your balance sheet's the most important statement. Mm. No, that's a good point. And, and I think that, you know, <clears throat> I've, got, I've, I've got a friend who who's, owns a, a fairly large manufacturing facility, and he's kind of a visionary guy, right? So he's... He is all about, you know, mission and vision and uh, where he's going to take the company in the next 10 or 15 years. But today, th- there's challenges, right? right? And, and it all stems around exactly what you were talking about. Because I think uh, oftentimes we, we need someone to tell us the hard truth, right? right. That Absolutely. This line of business or this segment of our business, we have to stop funding it. Right. Because it is, it's losing money. Right. And, you know, I mean, have you ran into that? Where yeah. the, where the, And it's okay to have a loss <clears throat> leader because some businesses will have that. I've, mm-hmm. I've had it with companies that I've worked with, you know, is that, you know, you may have a, you know, three or four segments of income or revenue streams, right? But you may have this other thing over here that's, that's a loss leader. Mm-hmm. And, but that's okay because the other things are making, you know, that are making up for it. Mm. Um, but you do have to realize that if you only have two products and, or two s- service segments or what have you, and one cannot support the one that's a lose uh, as a loss leader, then you need to re-strategize or figure out how to make that loss leader a, a, mm-hmm. a profitable segment of the business. Um, really but they'll say, Melanie, this, this is what we started our business on. And but if it isn't making you money, <laughs> what, what are you doing at the end of but, the day? You're not, you're not going to be able to, but, that vision that you have, you can kiss it goodbye because this is not going to get you there. <laughs> But you know, this, make that a hobby, honey. <laughs> make that a hobby. See that—that's—that's that's what's so special about you is because you can you can do that. Because I'm sure you've had they've you've heard those conversations. Oh, this is this is my baby. Right. This is uh, where I really. This see is really the what I want to do. That's hey, right. I get it. That's what you really want to do. But do you want to feed your family? Right. You know. Do you want to put your kids through school? You know. If you do, if you want to do those things. You got to let go of this for a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, just let it go just so that you can concentrate on making this part of your business mm-hmm. profitable. And then you can go back and, and take a second look at the other. That's right. I, I see so many times folks are, they're kind of trying to duct tape every piece of their oh, business. Yeah. And uh, I think you could come in and say, this, this is, is where your cash flow is coming from. Right. So let's maybe let's put some of these other things to the side for now. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So walk me through kind of um, first visit with a client. Um, How how does that work? And then how do they go from uh, from that first initial consultation to ultimately um, looking at some projects? Gotcha. Yeah. So when we meet with a client, a lot of times they don't even know what they need. Mm. They know that they're they're having difficulties. They they may know that they're in trouble. They may not be in trouble, but they may want to grow their business and just don't know how to go about that. So the first thing that we like to do is go in and really do an exploration of the business, okay. really get in there and understand what is it that the team is trying to accomplish. Um, what are y'all doing really well and what aren't you doing well? And then 
then try and pick out um, so once we we do that, then having a group meeting with everybody, but then the, the important meetings are the individual meetings. Mm. Because when the management team's <laughs> all together, they're going to play nice in the sandbox That's because right. the boss man with the paychecks is right there, right? <laughs> so um, you get the individuals segregated, and you kind of really just ask, you know, if, if this was your business, what would you do? What would you do differently? You know, and you can really get in some, to some deep information um, from everybody in all the different departments. Mm-hmm. So what we like to do is kind of take that and then go away and kind of come back to, you know, kind of letting the business owner know, hey, okay, so here's what you're doing well. This is what you guys probably need some assistance on. Here's kind of like our priority list that we kind of put together of different things. Now, what do you want to do? And they can take that um, list and go go away and, and do it themselves. Or most likely, they're going to hire us because mm. now we've pinpointed out some of the the obstacles that they have, and we're going to come in there and help them untangle those obstacles. Okay. Um, so, and that usually ends up being where I don't call us consultants because we're not consultants. We are when we get engaged with a client, we're a part of that client. We are part of their leadership team. We are their financial expertise. Okay, and we don't have all the answers. Nobody does. And anybody that comes in and tells you that they can do it all, they're crazy. They're, they're, they're lying. Um, we have other people that we strategize with that help us do our job. Mm. Um, so if I, if I can come in and I can engage somebody to do a, per, a specific piece of the puzzle, that's going to help the organize, organization as a whole, I'm not getting paid for that, but it's a piece of the puzzle that's important to the owner. And that's what's important. It's important that we get the business owner driving down the right road to their vision, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever that means, that's what we want to do. And at the end of the day, that's, I really love helping people. That's the one thing that I love doing the most Mm -hmm. is really just seeing these business owners, their, their shoulders go, oh. Thank you so much for your help, mm-hmm. you know, because I, did, I wouldn't have known this or I, I wouldn't have been able to get where I want to go without that. Mm-hmm. Well, it, and then so that that initial consultation, what is, is there an investment for that? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So there's a, a, a flat fee mm-hmm. um, uh, for that okay. uh, for that service. And then what we do after that is it depends on the client. It can be just one-off project work and that we can do on an hourly basis, um, or we're going to do a retainer okay. um, of some sort. Okay. Now, what I'm just as as you're mentioning the the the, the CEO or the owner company, they finally uh, let go of the stress. But is there a little animosity or a little bit of uh, reluctancy for them to actually? share everything at first <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah i mean because we get deep you know we, yeah. a lot of times we'll get into their personal lives you know and well yeah it's just part of it you know and so you know you, you start looking at some of the personal stuff and maybe um the bus- business owner isn't playing so nice with with the other side of that family mm-hmm. side right yeah and that can get kind of dicey right. um or somebody wants to hide money from some, you know, another from their family members. Mm-hmm. You know that can get dicey. Um, or partners. Right. Um, I was involved um, in a. Um, uh, this was a, some time ago, but I did some bookkeeping for a um, uh, restaurant chain. We'll just put it to okay. that. Okay. <laughs> so um, it was a restaurant chain. And I was doing some accounting work, and I thought that I guess they thought that they were getting one of those bookkeepers that didn't know what they were doing, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's a lot of those out there, people. So just people beware. <laughs> um, and so I was putting one and one together, and it wasn't coming to two, and you know just kept on seeing more and more stuff that wasn't making sense. So I started making some phone calls because this again. Um, is not an easy situation to talk about, right? But it needs to be told. Right. And um, the next thing I knew, because I was saying, hey, this doesn't look right. It looks like we've got something going on. I think there was embezzlement going on with some of the partners mm. that the other partners didn't know about. And then long and behold, before I knew it, one of the partners was at my house collecting all the accounting records that I had. Really? Yes. They said, uh, we, we, need to, we need to stop this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they stopped that. And I didn't get paid. No. No, no. they jacked me. 
Uh, they jacked me. So needless to say, I don't go to that chain anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, um, uh, that's that's just horrible. I mean, to uh, but I guess they it happens, you know, and people just. You just want to kind of like w- wake up and smell the roses, business people. You know, I know you want to trust every, you know, everybody that's out there. But just and there's, and don't get me wrong. There's a, most of the most of the people out there that are doing what we're doing is all honest people. Right. But you do. It's just like with anything. There's always the bad, a few bad seeds out mm-hmm. there that we've got to be aware of. Mm-hmm. And it may never happen to you. But you're. But how are you going to know if it's happening to you if you don't? have somebody else kind of taking a look at it. Right. Yeah. Have the, have that advocate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah. I think that's what, and that's a perfect you know, word for it is that we are definitely the advocate. We have the business owner's best interest at heart at any project that we're doing. Yeah. And when we go in, we are t- thinking of that person um, and we have their back at all times. Um, you know, uh, integrity is uh, the highest value here. Um, what is said to us, you know, is, is stays with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not going to go out and, you know, uh, and give their information out to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. No, that's huge. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, <clears throat> what do you see for 2020? I mean, what are you seeing out in, you know, what, what should businesses kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of the fourth quarter or going into 2020. Um, where should businesses uh, start focusing their time and energy as it relates to accounting? Yeah, I think um, I was thinking about this the other day, and I I kept on going back to this, and that's budgets. People hate budgets, right? It's like you're pulling a number out of the wall, you know, or out of the ceiling or what have you, and you're just putting it on a piece of paper. But it's really more than that, and I think if more people would understand that, Putting a budget together is not an easy process. And mm. the thought of putting budgets together just is like, an, it's like oh, my God, that's got to be a nightmare. I don't mm-hmm. want to do it. Or it's not going to be meaningful. But what you're ended up doing is that you're putting all the right people together to come up with a strategy, mm. whether you realize it or not. Because you're going to, you know, whether you do it from the bottom, and when I mean the bottom up, you, some people take it from the net income mm-hmm. and then drive from the net income and go up from that. Or I usually like to take it from the sales from the top level and go down because you got sales. So you take what your revenue, whether it's manufacturing, service, construction, whatever, but you get those people together Mm -hmm. in a room and you decide what is it that you're going to do next year from a a sales perspective. Um, And then you got then your costs that are uh, that are part of those revenues. Right. What is it going to cost us to create those revenues? Those mm-hmm. are your direct costs or your mm-hmm. cost of goods. And then all your expenses and overheads, mm-hmm. right? And once you put all that in paper, then you have the, you've got something solid that you can, you can judge against. So if you create that now for mm-hmm. 2020, then when you get to January, now you have something at the end of January, then you have something to compare it against because now you have a budget. Right, you had the budget. You, ha- you had a vision that this is what we were going to do. But now January comes along, and now it's showing us something different. Right? Okay. Well, why is it different? Why is sales different? What happened with the cost? What happened with the expenses? Good or bad? There's changes. It's never going to match what you what you thought you budgeted. Right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you're in the ball field. Well, maybe you're not. Well, then why aren't you? So then you can forecast from there. Then you can say, okay, well, we're going to keep the budget because this is what we thought we were going to do. Ha- now we have our actuals, and now we're going to forecast what we think we're going to do. Mm. And so you have this rolling forecast going forward from one month to, a, to another. But you still have in your budget and your system, so you have a comparison, right? And so you can look at this, and then that means that you're having conversations with your organization, right? Now you're getting the employees your team members are seeing, you know what, mm-hmm. oh, the, the owner's serious about this. They, you know, you get engagement from mm. them, right? You get engagement from the people that are working for you. They're going to do a hell of a lot more mm-hmm. for you, right? A, and so we, if you do that, your company is going to naturally grow mm. because now you got the people behind you. And if there's one thing I always tell every client, is that your number one asset, your number one thing that you need to be doing first and foremost is your employees. Mm. Make sure you have the right people in the right spots. Don't look at the person. Look at the position. What are the positions you have? Mm. 
maybe this person over here isn't the right one for your production manager. Maybe this person that you have as a production manager, maybe they, they should be your sales manager and your sales manager should be your production manager. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you need to really look at that because your people are number one. Once you get that figured out and you do these budgets and you really look at your financials on a monthly basis and you do the forecast, your, your company is going to grow. Yeah. No, I like that. I mean, it's, it's hard to, uh, if you don't have a scoreboard, right? it's hard to know where you're at in the game, right? Right. But right. even if they have a scoreboard, if they're not looking at it, it's not going to do you any good, that's right. right? Yeah. So. so, and you guys can help with it because I think that's one of the things that's so crucial to what you and your team does is y'all can help hold those conversations. Absolutely. And, and have those individual conversations. But that's, that's that back to the advocate of the business owner and the executives is you guys aren't coming in with the same storyline that everybody has. Right. You're coming in with that third party um, outlook, uh, you know, being the advocate for exactly. the business owner. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, that is huge. Well, I think, uh, I think that's a good place to end it. And I'm so thankful for you to come on the show. Oh, thank you. I think it's great. What you guys are doing here is getting this information out to the community. And, well, and we're I really trying. appreciate it. And Melanie's not your ordinary accountant. So, uh, no. <laughs> please. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or I a think bad it's a thing. Great thing. You so. know, I was, lis I was listening on my way over here. I was listening to Guns N' Roses. Yes, I'm a hard rocker. I love rock and roll. <laughs> and, uh, but I love the little country too. So, um, <laughs> but I was listening to Guns N' Ro Roses. Uh, welcome to the jungle. Well, let me tell you, pep folks, yeah, counting is welcome to the jungle, <laughs> welcome right? Welcome to the jungle. <laughs> so, um, look, Melanie Zeman up, North Georgia CFOs, um, We'll have a link to the show for all of her contact. And again, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Appreciate all right. it.